Good afternoon, everyone. I'd like to welcome you to our inaugural seminar series called Breakthroughs in Cancer. This is a brand new seminar series sponsored by the Stanford Cancer Institute, and I want to welcome you all on behalf of the SCI, my deputy director, Dr. Heather Wakeley, our associate director of basic science, Dr. Raj Rahatki, who really did much of the lion's work in assembling this really uh, fascinating seminar series. This seminar series is a monthly seminar series. And um, here is the lineup, as you see, uh, Dr. Lena Gandhi, Luis Diaz, Susan Domchek, David Hong, Jen Wargo, Charles Sawyers, Ursula Magellanus, and Catherine Wu. The purpose of this series is to bring leaders in translational cancer research from around the country and around the world to the Stanford campus. We're going to have an in-person seminar series every month. And there's also a Zoom option for those of you who may not be able to make it, but we would uh, encourage as many of you to make it as possible to come to this seminar series in person. Um, the visitor is going to have a, a whole day at Stanford, have lunch with, um, with trainees, meet with faculty. There's a reception afterward, and we have a reception afterward um, this afternoon as well. So please join us outside once we're done. And the whole point is for each of you to get to uh, experience some of the exciting science from some of these speakers and also get to know them a bit personally as well. And we are thrilled for our inaugural speaker uh, to be Dr. Carolyn Bertozzi, whom I will introduce in a moment. But first, I want to introduce David Entwistle, who is the CEO of Stanford Healthcare. And we are in his house literally right now in this beautiful conference room assembly hall. Uh, so David, please uh, make a few remarks. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Dr. Artande. I appreciate that. And Welcome, everyone. It's great to see such an august group. Now, I'll tell you, when we opened this building in the fall of 2019, what immediately hit? COVID. And what did we immediately do? We shut all of this space down. So it's wonderful to see you in this and taking advantage of this. I appreciate Steve just giving me a moment to say welcome. Think about this opportunity to talk about what are the newest areas and what are the breakthroughs and cancers that we have the opportunity to learn from. And I know we do a lot here at Stanford. There's an incredible amount of work that goes on. There's an incredible amount, whether it's basic science, translational science, clinical science, even population health science that we're doing. How do we expand our knowledge base? And there's a lot in this room that are providing that great care. There's also a lot of great folks that are doing the research. We want to use this series to expand everyone's knowledge base about what's going on in cancer and even more importantly, what's going on here at Stanford. And so I'm very excited about this. I also want to thank Dr. Artandi, Raj, the whole team that have actually put this and curated this whole group. This is an amazing set of speakers and the work that you put into this is quite uh, impressive. Now, the one thing that you want to learn as the CEO is to never get in way of who is really the key speaker. And so to have a Nobel laureate here today speaking to you, I will get out of the way and let Carolyn uh, do that. But let me turn the time back over to Steve to introduce her. Thank you all and welcome. Thank you, David. So it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Carolyn Bertozzi, who uh, has been our colleague at Stanford now for about seven and a half years. Before that, she was at Berkeley as a star and highly innovative chemist. Uh, she is currently now the Baker Family Director of ChemH, um, and she is the Robert Bass Professor in the Department of Chemistry here at Stanford. She's, of course, an HHMI investigator, and her research focuses on uh, profiling changes in cell surface glycosylation in cancer and immunity and infectious disease. Uh, Carolyn is a member of the National Academy of Medicine, the National Academy of Sciences, and has won numerous awards, most recently the Nobel Prize in Chemistry, and we're thrilled again to have her as our inaugural speaker at Breakthroughs in Cancer. Carolyn, welcome. Thank you. Oh, am I on here? How's that? Um, this was a tough day for us uh, at Serafan Chem H. Um, some of you might not know that we lost a giant today. Uh, so um, I'm dedicating this lecture to Professor Chris Walsh, a dear friend. Um, he was 
probably the most influential biochemist of this century. Uh, Chris, you know, started his academic career at MIT. And when he was there, he wrote one of the defining textbooks in molecular enzymology. And I studied with that textbook uh, when I was an undergraduate at Harvard uh, back in the 1980s. Um, he had an illustrious career, which um, went from MIT to Harvard Medical School and included a stint as the head of the Dana-Farber. Uh, so Chris was an incredibly influential in cancer research and he has influenced um, every chemical biologist, every biochemist, molecular biologist, and many physicians throughout a long and incredible uh, lifetime and career. We had the great privilege of hosting him as a kind of visiting professor slash advisor to Chem H. Uh, Chaitan Koshla invited him to join us early on when we were just conceiving of the Institute. And he had retired from Harvard Medical School and was looking to spend more time in California. And in particular here at Stanford where his daughter is a physician and where he could spend more time with his grandchildren. Um, so we're all kind of shocked uh, and stunned that suddenly we're in a world without him. And this is a first, the first day of that world for me. So I'm gonna do my best uh, to honor his legacy and um, for all of us maybe to take a minute and think about how Chris influenced our lives. Thank you. Okay, on to the task at hand. Um, and I think Chris would be happy to see that we're gonna to continue to talk about science and, and learn from each other. And today, uh, the science that I'm talking about is the work that I started at Berkeley around the year 2010, and which was a major driver for me to relocate from Berkeley to Stanford uh, to be an environment where oncologists and physician scientists could um, help me understand how we could translate our findings from the basic science into new therapies for cancer, and in particular, for immune therapies that are rooted in the field of glycoscience, which is the field that I've been interested in and contributing to uh, since I was a graduate student back in the 80s. And the story starts with an observation that is even older than I am. Um, Back in the late 1950s was the first time that I read accounts in the literature of changes in glycosylation that are associated with tumors. Um, and throughout the 1960s and 70s and 80s, um, related reports would come out from time to time until you know, after half a century of this, there was this overwhelming body of evidence showing that glycosylation patterns change on cancer and that this might relate to disease progression. And there was one phenotype in particular, which seemed to be prevalent across many different cancer types, which was the overproduction of glycostructures that terminate with a sugar called sialic acid. And let's see, that's this pink sugar here. That's the chemical structure of the sugar. And um, the glycoscientist has a symbolic lexicon that we use to describe glycostructures. And in that lexicon, the sialic acid is, is this pink diamond. So the way I like to think about it is we have sialoglycans, as they're called, on all of our cells in certain patterns. But healthy cells have a well-manicured garden of sialoglycans. And the cells within these tumors would basically overgrow sialoglycans and you'd have like a tropical rainforest. So the density would go up, the actual details of the structures underlying the sialic acids would change. Sometimes the scaffolds presenting the sialoglycans would change. And you might see differences in the details from tumor type to tumor type or from patient to patient, but this elevated abundance of sialic acid was quite pervasive. And really nobody knew why. So it was a bit of a frustrating literature to read 
if you are a chemist or a molecular scientist who likes to understand mechanisms. Well, the field had some insight um, back in the early 2000s when the field of cancer immunology uh, had a step function in its maturation. And I don't have to give much of a primer to this audience because I think as cancer scientists, all of us you know, have, have read the book now on the role that the immune system plays in protecting us from cancer when everything is going well. So we now know that our immune cells, they patrol the body and they sample the cells in our tissues to look for signs of damage as well as to look for foreign invaders. And a cancer cell is an example of a damaged cell. Typically that starts with damage to the chromosomes or DNA damage. And that damage is then reflected in signatures that ultimately make their way to the surface of the cell. For example, mutated DNA can be transcribed to mutated RNA, which can be translated to mutated proteins. And peptides from those mutated proteins can be presented in MHC molecules on the surface of the cell. And that is a way for a cell to alert the immune system that something is wrong and that cell ought to be eliminated from the body. So the immune cells form these synapses and they sample the merchandise and they look for these signatures of damage. So here's a very overly simplified cartoon of what that synapse might look like between the immune cell and the cancer cell. And I have simplified what are dozens of receptors on the immune cell down to two classifications. So some of those receptors on immune cells are activating receptors. They are looking for the damage signals. And if there's enough of those engagements at the synapse, those activating receptors were, will signal to the immune cell that it's time to react and to do the job of eliminating that cancer cell. And the way that immune cells eliminate cancer cells, it varies based on the type of immune cell. They each have their own mechanisms. But some of those immune cells, like the killer T cell or the NK cell, do a direct kill on that target, like they launch a bomb, for example. Now, this is a wonderful capability that immune cells have because by eliminating these damaged cells, they can extend our life. At the same time, they're playing with fire because if your immune cells make a mistake and kill healthy cells, that can lead to an autoimmune disease. So we have checkpoints that can protect us from this kind of autoimmune reactivity. And those are the other class of receptors called the inhibitory receptors. And they're basically doing the opposite of what the activating receptors do. Those inhibitory receptors are looking for signatures that are healthy signatures. So if a cell has enough of these healthy signals and can engage sufficient inhibitory receptors, a signal is delivered to the immune cell basically to lay off. And for any given synapse, there can be a competition between inhibitory signaling and activating signaling, and the immune cell is integrating the inputs from all of these receptor ligand interactions and making a decision. Do I react and kill, or do I lay off and move to the next target? And it's that balance that gives us, for the most part, protection against cancer and also protection against autoimmunity. Now, through the work of many great immunologists and oncologists over many decades, what we came to learn is that a successful tumor that can escape killing by the immune system has often gained the ability to overproduce healthy signals. And it's tricking the immune cell into thinking it's healthy because the inhibitory signal can overpower the activating signal coming from those damage signatures. And that led to the development of you know, these absolutely transformative immune therapies that have actually cured people from cancers that were previously 100% fatal. And these first generation of immune therapies act by blocking the interaction between inhibitory checkpoint receptors and their ligands. So, you know, when I was at Berkeley 
the later part of first decade of the 2000s, um, the clinical data for the checkpoint inhibitor therapies was just getting released and everyone was very excited. And many of us have now seen these Kaplan-Meier curves from those phase three clinical readouts in the early days of the PD-1 blockers and the PD-L1 blockers and the CTLA-4 blockers. And so here's one regurgitated, you know, from a publication in the New England Journal. Um, these were the phase three data for um, metastatic melanoma, where patients were treated either with an antibody that blocks CTLA-4, one of the T-cell checkpoint receptors, or an antibody that blocks PD-1, another T-cell checkpoint receptor, or a combination of both of those monoclonal antibodies. And the excitement came when some patients, you know, a minority, but a significant minority of patients, were able to achieve a durable remission from metastatic melanoma, which was 100% fatal, right, before we had these kinds of interventions. And since that time, you know, there has been basically a, a tidal wave of drug development where every company with a major oncology program has developed an antibody that blocks these checkpoint receptors. So the number one selling drug in Mert's portfolio is Keytruda. And I think it's projected to be their number one seller now for many, many years to come. Yervoy came from Bristol Myers Squibb. It was the first CTLA-4 blocker. And I had an upfront seat to the development of Yervoy because it started as an antibody developed in Jim Allison's lab when he was at Berkeley with me. And then later came Opdivo, that's BMS's PD-1 blocker, and then Libtio, and so on and so on and so on. And now there's a suite of FDA-approved antibodies that are used often in combination with other treatments in certain indications where there's a reasonable patient response. Now, back in 2012 and 2013, when the first FDA approvals were made, you could read about checkpoint inhibitors and cancer immune therapy, not only in the scientific journals, but in the supermarket checkout line. So even my parents, who are not biologists or physicians, um, were reading you know, about immune therapies on time, in Time Magazine, right, in Newsweek, of course, Science and Nature, and I think it was breakthrough of the year, cancer immune therapy, and that was, I can't read it here, but I think it was 2012. This was quite striking. The new scientist named immune therapies as cancer's penicillin moment. That's a pretty dramatic thing to say when you think about what pe penicillin did for bacterial infectious disease. And people thought, could immune therapy do the same thing, which is basically cure many cancers? And Jimmy Carter would have said, yeah, because you know, he was one of the high profile early patients who actually benefited from treatment with an immune therapy pursuant to his diagnosis of metastatic melanoma, which had gone to his brain and he lived and he survived. And of course, some years later, Jim Allison and Tasuku Hanjo were awarded the Nobel Prize in Physiology and Medicine for the fundamental science behind these incredible new drugs. But we also know that most patients don't respond to this first generation of T cell checkpoint inhibitor therapies. And if you kind of aggregate numbers from a number of different clinical trials, they look something like this, where melanoma patients have the highest likelihood of response. Um, you know, maybe 45% of those patients over a two year period have progression free survival. And these drugs have been approved in other indications as well, uh, but in aggregate, the response rates are even lower than that, slightly less than half. And so what this means is that while some patients have a dramatic, miraculous response to treatment with immune therapies, the majority of patients still do not. And for the last decade, you know, one of the big questions in the field is, are there other pathways? that might be even more important in immune suppression that are giving cancers the ability to subvert immunological recognition independent of the T cell checkpoint receptors and their ligands.
there have been a number of candidates, there have been a number of antibodies that block those candidates and a number of clinical studies. There have been a few approvals of other immune therapies that target other molecules, um, but none quite so dramatic as the T-cell checkpoint inhibitors. So why were we paying such close attention to this as a bunch of glycoscientists at UC Berkeley? And it comes back to that observation, which again is an observation that was made starting over half a century ago, that cells, cancer cells in a tumor microenvironment tend to have this tropical rainforest of sialic acid compared to the surrounding tissue. And why is that? Well, courtesy of the Human Genome Sequencing Project, we now know that there is a family of immune modulatory receptors that bind sialoglycans. And they're called the sialic acid binding immunoglobulin-like lectins. And that's kind of a mouthful. So we call them the SIGLEC family of receptors. Before the human genome sequence, three members of this family were known. They had just been cloned in a kind of one-off way in different laboratories. So Jim Paulson at Scripps, Ajit Varki at UC San Diego, and Paul Crocker at University of Dundee were thinking about these receptors before the Human Genome Project and characterizing them. But after we had the whole sequence of the human genome, we learned that there's actually 14 members of this family in humans. And they are expressed sometimes in combinations on every immune cell type, literally. There isn't an immune cell in your body that doesn't have a few siglecs expressed on the cell surface. So this cartoon is meant to show you what their domain architectures look like. They're all single span transmembrane proteins. They have an extracellular domain, which comprises a variable number of Ig domains, which are the ovals. And then all of them have a so-called V set, also sometimes called an IgV domain, which is the part of the protein that binds sialoglycans. So they're carbohydrate binding proteins. Inside the cytosol, they have a cytoplasmic domain. This is where it gets interesting because as you can see from this cartoon, several members of the SIGLEC family have a motif familiar to immunologists called the ITIM motif. And four in the middle here, SIGLEC 7, 8, 9, and 10, have a tandem ITIM, ITSM motif. And without going through the alphabet soup, I'll just tell you that the ITIM, ITSM tandem domain motif is precisely the motif that allows PD-1 to signal inhibitory signals in the T cell. And that's because these domains can recruit enzymes called the SHIP phosphatases. They're called SHIP1 and SHIP2. And those phosphatases are the biochemical players in the inhibitory signaling pathway. So knowing what we knew you know, by 2012 about PD-1, and its success as a drug target for immune therapy, knowing that the SIGLECs, at least many of them, maybe nine out of the 14, have signaling modules that are identical to the signaling module in PD-1. But unlike PD-1, whose expression is somewhat restricted to the T cell, for example, the SIGLECs are expressed on every type of immune cell. So SIGLEC9, for example, is found on activated T cells, as well as NK cells, neutrophils, macrophages. SIGLEC7 is on also activated T cells and NK cells and macrophages. Myeloid cells of different types have SIGLEC3. Some of them have SIGLEC10. So the SIGLECs, in principle, could deliver inhibitory signals to immune cells far beyond the T cell. And they could be much broader players in immune suppression. And maybe, we hypothesized, the reason that tumors tend to overproduce sialic acids is because that allows them to engage the SIGLECs and to suppress immunological recognition. So just like PDL1 expression on the cancer cell allows PD1 engagement and inhibitory signaling delivered to the T cell, maybe the same thing is going on here between cancer cells and SIGLECs, and that's why the sialoglycans are overproduced. It would be a phenotype that would arise 
by natural selection under the pressure of immune surveillance. So we wanted to test that hypothesis experimentally. And again, this takes me back now to 2011 or 2012. And at that time, we were focusing on NK cells and the role that they play in cancer immunity. And so NK cells have an activating receptor called FC gamma R3. And that receptor binds the FC domain of antibodies that coat the surface of a target cell. So when an antibody bridges the synapse between an NK cell or a macrophage, which also expresses this receptor, and the cancer cell, that antibody can elicit a reaction by the NK cell, which leads to killing of the cancer cell. And that process is called antibody-dependent cell cytotoxicity, or ADCC. And so we asked the question, if the cancer cell has a high density of sialoglycans and therefore can engage a SIGLEC on the NK cell, and the predominant SIGLEC would be SIGLEC7 for that cell type, can the inhibitory signal through SIGLEC7 quench an activating signal through FC gamma R3? And the answer was yes, and we published this, that in fact, Sialylation at a high enough density can be a resistance mechanism against ADCC. And in fact, it will cause cancers to resist killing induced by some very prevalent cancer medicines. For example, Herceptin. This is the antibody trastuzumab uh, developed by Genentech, marketed by Roche, used to treat people with HER2 positive breast cancers or gastric cancers. And the mechanism of action of Herceptin is primarily ADCC, but if a breast cancer patient has high levels of sialic acid on their cancer cells, they will be resistant to Herceptin through this SIGLEC mechanism. And the same is true for our own homegrown Rituxan, which is the anti-CD20 antibody that's used to treat a variety of different conditions, but including B-cell lymphomas. So we published that. Um, that went out into the world around 2014. And then over the next five years, there were a sequence of publications from a number of different laboratories implicating different kinds of SIGLEX in different kinds of cancers as being related to immune resistance. And I'll highlight the one down at the bottom here because here's a paper published in Nature from our own Irv Weissman, who discovered that SIGLEX 10 is basically engaged by a cancer-associated glycoprotein called CD24. And SIGLEC10 is on macrophages, myeloid cells. And the engagement of SIGLEC10 is a mechanism by which those cancers can evade uh, phagocytosis by the macrophage. So all of that uh, prompted a very nice little perspective article in CNE News, which is the American Chemical Society kind of weekly magazine. And they basically proposed that the field of glycoscience might actually fuel a new breed of cancer immunotherapy. And the exciting prospect of that was something that my lab wanted to pursue. And it was one of the drivers for us to move from Berkeley to Stanford to be with you all here in a cancer center. So literally the minute we arrived here, uh, we, we started thinking about how could we develop a therapeutic strategy that leverages this insight into immune evasion through sialic acids and SIGLEX? And immediately you might think, well, how about just follow the playbook of the checkpoint inhibitors like Keytruda and Opdivo? These are antibodies that bind PD-1 on the T cell and block it so it cannot engage its ligands on the cancer cell. And you could picture a scenario where you make monoclonals that bind the SIGLEC in such a way that the carbohydrate binding domain is blocked. And such antibodies have been found and people use them in the research lab. But we were a little bit dubious about whether that would be a good therapeutic strategy for the simple reason that there isn't just one SIGLEC. There's a whole family of SIGLECs and most immune cells have more than one expressed at a time. So 
which one do you block? Do you need to block them in combinations? Will it be very dependent on the specific tumor and how it might have evolved to engage a particular SIGLEC predominantly? But you'd have to know which SIGLEC was the most important for that patient and for that tumor. And because that book really had not been written yet, and to this day, we're still working on that book, I would say, um, we just didn't think we had enough information to make a good choice about blocking a SIGLEC with a therapeutic antibody. The one thing we did know is that although the ligands for the SIGLECs vary from SIGLEC to SIGLEC, all of them minimally have to possess a sialic acid residue. So that sialic acid sugar is part of the binding domain for the ligands of every SIGLEC. And different SIGLECs will recognize molecules beyond the sialic acid. Some of them are looking for a specific underlying sugar in addition to the sialic acid. Some of them are looking for a scaffolding protein that's presenting the glycan, including the sialic acid. But without the sialic acid, all the SIGLECs lose binding affinity to their ligands. So we thought if we could target sialic acids on cancer cells therapeutically, we could take out the ligands for any SIGLEC and it would be a SIGLEC agnostic therapeutic strategy. So how do you go after sialic acids as a drug target? We had in our mind the idea of making a medicine that would behave like a lawnmower where we could park it on the surface of the cancer cell and it would just mow the lawn and cut the sialic acids off and strip that cancer cell from its ability to engage with any member of the SIGLEC family. So at a molecular scale, what does that lawnmower look like? It was a fusion between a tumor targeting antibody and an enzyme called a sialidase. So sialidases are well known in the world of enzymology. Um, they're mentioned in Chris Walsh's textbook from the 1980s. That was the decade where the influenza virus, neuraminidase, was discovered to be essential for the flu life cycle. And that's why today's flu drugs are primarily inhibitors of that influenza sialidase, like relenza and Tamiflu. That's what those molecules do. We humans have sialidases. We need them for catabolism of our sialic acids. And bacteria often have sialidases as well. And we borrowed one from the bacterium Salmonella to make a proof of concept molecule where we fused that enzyme to trastuzumab, the HER2 targeting antibody that is the active substance in Herceptin. And the idea here was that this trastuzumab sialidase conjugate, or we abbreviate it T sia, would attach itself to HER2 positive cells, in this case, let's say breast cancer cells. And in parking the sialidase on those HER2 positive cells, the activity of the enzyme would be restricted to those cells. I won't go through the gory details, and this is now published work anyways, but we actually had to engineer the sialidase to make it less active than it would normally be. We made some mutations so that the KM value, the Michaelis constant, was higher than normal. And what that means is that it wasn't very good at binding to its substrates all, all by itself. It would bump into cells and do nothing because it really wasn't able to latch on. But the antibody compensates for that on the target cell type. Whereas the off-target cells lacking sufficient HER2 expression would not be able to park the enzyme locally in those environments. So the credit for these molecules goes to former postdoc, Han Shao. He was the first postdoc to join my lab at Stanford. And now he's an assistant professor at Rice University, still making cool antibody therapeutics for cancer. And then Melissa Gray, who was the very first class of grad students to join my lab at Stanford, also a student in our um, ChemH CBI program. So she did us proud. Um, she contributed to this as well. And in fact, she made the first conjugate that has the shape that I'm showing here. And she graduated and is now a postdoctoral fellow at Stanford in my colleague Stephen Bannock's lab. So she's still here around. 
And for this first generation of kind of tool compounds, we fused the antibody and the enzyme together using some chemistry. And hopefully now bioorthogonal chemistry is a household name. That wasn't true before October. <laughs> Um, but the bioorthogonal chemistries that we had developed years earlier at Berkeley turned out to have lots of interesting applications for making protein conjugates, and we took advantage of them to build these antibody enzyme fusions. So we used two bioorthogonal chemistries to do this. The first bioorthogonal chemistry is something we call the Pictet Spengler ligation. And you have to be kind of a hardcore organic chemist to know what the Pictet Spengler reaction is. It was first published in like 1915. Who here knows the Pictet Spengler reaction? There is not a chemist in the audience who's willing to self identify. <laughs> There's nothing to be embarrassed about. Um, it's a great reaction that occurs between functionalized indoles, and that's what this is this is an indole, and aldehydes. Now, the biochemists here will be looking at those aldehydes and think to themselves, there's no aldehyde on a protein normally, and you're right, there isn't, but we developed a technology to introduce aldehydes into amino acid side chains in a site-specific genetically encoded fashion. And that's a technology we commercialized to make antibody drug conjugates, turned out to be useful for antibody enzyme conjugates as well. So we had aldehyde tagged trastuzumab right down near the C-terminus of the heavy chain. And then we built this molecule that had the indole for the Pictet Spengler ligation on one side and an azide, N3, on the other side. And so that allowed us to do a site-specific attachment of two of these linker molecules, each which terminates with an azide. Then we brought in the second bioorthogonal chemistry, and that is the so-called copper-free click chemistry between a cyclooctyne, which is this eight-membered ring stop sign looking thing with a triple bond, which has just the perfect reactivity to match with the azide. So the two of these will get together and click, on goes the protein. And the protein, we had reacted with this cyclooctyne uh, linker by alkylating a single cysteine residue through this chloroacetamide group. That's the only chemistry slide I'm gonna show in this entire talk, okay? So we're done now, okay? Um, once we made this molecule, we needed to test whether it was truly selective for the on-target cells and hopefully not reactive with the off-target cells because the last thing you wanna do in the human patient is strip the sialic acids off of every cell in the body. That could lead to massive autoimmunity. And so, Melissa did this cool experiment where she mixed together in the same tube two different cell types, one of which was HER2 negative, the other HER2 positive in this two color flow plot. You can see that stained on the X axis with a HER2 antibody. Both of these cell types had roughly the same density of sialic acids, and we quantitate that by staining them with a lectin called SNA that binds sialic acid. So you can see on the Y axis, they're comparable in their fluorescence intensity. Now we expose the mixture to that t sia conjugate and ask the question, who loses their sialic acids? And we tested that conjugate at different concentrations, starting from 0.6 nanomolar, so sub-nanomolar, all the way up to triple-digit nanomolar. But even at these low doses, you can see that the HER2 positive cells, which started in the upper right-hand quadrant, have dropped to the lower right. They lost their sialic acids. By contrast, the HER2 negative cells, totally unaffected until you get to very high doses in which you start to see a little bit of loss, a little off-target activity at these high doses. But we thought we had a therapeutic window here, which would allow us to choose a dose in animals and then in humans where we could get good separation of on-target to off-target desialylation. And one of the animal models we ran was in collaboration with my friend, Heinz Laubli. He's an oncologist at University Hospital Basel who prescribes immune therapies to patients and is also doing CAR T trials. And his grad student, Michael Stanzak, had set up a murine breast cancer model using the EMT6 
mammary breast cancer cell line that had been engineered to express human HER2. And this is a model that was known in the literature to be resistant to trastuzumab alone. And we were able to repeat that observation. So in this tumor model, we graft the, two, the cells into the mammary fat pad. So they grow in an orthotopic setting. And then when the tumors have reached a certain volume, we administered different reagents on different days. And you can see that mice treated with naked trastuzumab, which is the blue curve, um, their tumors grew at the same rate as mice treated with saline, with PBS. So trastuzumab resistant in our hands as well. However, when that trastuzumab was carrying sialidases at two different doses, now the tumors had a much harder time in grafting and they were infiltrated with immune cells. They weren't cold as the tumors were when the mice were just treated with trastuzumab alone. So examples of these kinds of data from a variety of models um, motivated us to try to translate this concept into a human therapeutic. And to achieve that, I formed a company called Pallion Pharmaceuticals, which is located in Waltham, Massachusetts, because the other co-founder of this company was Paul Crocker from University of Dundee. And if you look at Palo Alto and Dundee and ask what's in the middle, it's Boston. <laughs> also happens to be a great place uh, to do immune therapies for cancer uh, because of the hospitals and the patient populations. Um, that doesn't mean Stanford's not important in this regard as well, as you'll see. Okay. The scientists at Pallion made some very important improvements to our tool molecule. So whereas we had made through chemical conjugation, these fusions between monoclonal antibodies and the bacterial sialidase from salmonella, we knew that a bacterial enzyme was not a good choice for a human therapeutic because it would be immunogenic in, in humans and elicit the production of probably neutralizing antibodies. So the Pallion folks switched over to a human sialidase called NU2, which we had tried to use in our lab, but it was a very difficult protein that expressed poorly and had bad physical properties. It was aggregating, just wasn't stable. And after making 350 plus constructs, the Pallion scientists identified a form of human NU2 that could express as a genetic fusion with the FC uh, heavy chain. So they made this molecule where now it's, it's kind of like a hetero trimer between a heavy chain and a light chain from native trastuzumab on the one side, and then human NU2 replacing one of the FAB domains on the other with an FC. And so it's a monovalent antibody that has a molecular weight that's kind of on par with a natural monoclonal. And its pharmacokinetic properties are more like an antibody than the molecules that we had made early on. And they did a deal with a company in China to develop this um, for breast cancer, and they'll be filing their IND probably this quarter, first quarter of 2023. But behind that molecule, they have another untargeted sialidase, which is already in a phase one, two clinical trial. And I thought I would point this out because um, Stanford is one of the clinical trial sites for E602, which was their first pipeline candidate. Um, and Chris Chen, I don't know if you're here in the audience today, my eyes aren't good enough to find you, but Chris is the PI on this trial. He works uh, closely with Heather Wakeley and her group, and um, they're enrolling patients here for five different cancer types. So lung, pancreatic, ovarian, colon, and melanoma. Um, there are another 12 trial sites across the country enrolling patients as well. Um, they've been doing dose escalation since early 2022, and they're now up to what we think will be probably the therapeutic dose. So far, so good. Adverse reactions are almost zero. Um, PD markers look great, and now they're going to look for signs of efficacy. I'll make the plea here that um, when we started this enrollment with so many different cancer types, our hope was that we could get a lot of patients quickly. And we have gotten a lot of patients in certain cancer types. So colon cancer has really been a dominant uh, for our enrollment. But we've had fewer patients uh, with melanoma or with lung cancer. There's lots of other trials, of course, that those patients can consider. Um, but we would love to have more patients from those cancer types. I'm just going to throw this out there in case anybody has influence over these kinds of things. 
Okay. So that's happening, and hopefully soon we'll learn in humans whether our hypothesis is correct, which is that stripping sialic acids off of cancer cells can render them susceptible to immune cell killing. But in the meantime, there were a lot of questions in the basic science in this system that we really wanted to understand better. So like I said, for more than 50 years, oncologists and pathologists have noticed that these tumors often overexpress sialoglycans. But to this day, we really didn't have a very good understanding of how that happens. So what happened inside the cell that led to this burst of sialoglycans on the cell surface? And we were thinking about how to address that question. And I'll bring you back to this analogy that we were thinking of between the PD-1, PD-L1 axis and the siglec sialoglycan axis. And here I was at Stanford in 2015. And a year later, our good friend, Dean Felsher, publishes this paper in Science. And what his team had discovered was that MYC, one of the most prevalent human oncogenes, and we know that MYC can be overexpressed in a preponderant number of human cancers, and also it's mutated in certain cancers, and MYC is well known to drive transcriptional programs for cell proliferation. So it kind of makes sense to think about MYC overexpression and proliferative disease. But what Dean and his team discovered is that MYC can also drive a program of immune suppression. And in the models that his lab was studying, he found that MYC can drive transcription of CD47, the don't eat me signal that Irv Weissman's group has translated into a therapeutic. And also the expression of PDL1, the ligand for PD1. So we couldn't help but wonder when we read that paper whether MYC could also drive the upregulation of sialoglycans that would interact with the SIGLEX. And we reached out to his team and he got really excited about working together to ask this question experimentally. So Dean's lab. Um, has an incredible collection of MYC transgenic model systems where you can turn up MYC with small molecule tools or turn down MYC with small molecule tools and then ask comparative questions between what happens in the MYC on state or the MYC off state. And so we partnered with him to look at SIGLEC ligand regulation in response to MYC in a mouse model of T-cell acute lymphoblastic leukemia. And this was a particular T-ALL cell type that was sort of addicted to MYC, as Dean would have put it. So in this model, when you take away doxycycline from the cell culture media or from the mouse diet, MYC goes up. There's a transgene that turns on. Whereas when you add doxycycline to the cell culture media or to the animal's diet, MYC goes down, the transgene goes off. So you have these isogenic cell populations with high MYC or low MYC, and you can compare them and ask questions. And so Benji Smith, who's a Stanford M MSTP student who was doing his PhD in my lab, took on this project and compared these cells using RNA-seq, using mass spectrometry to inventory the abundance of different glycans under these two conditions. And then he did functional experiments with recombinant soluble SIGLEC FC reagents. And by the way, these are commercial. So R&D labs sells all the human and all the mouse FC SIGLEC fusions. You can buy them and use them for immunohistochemistry, flow cytometry, whatever you want. And they read out on the density of SIGLEC ligands on your cell type of interest or on your tumor tissue, for example. So we use those as probes in flow cytometry experiments. And here's a summary of what Benji discovered. First of all, the RNA-seq data, just focusing on the 2,000 or so glycogenes, showed that particular genes were highly regulated by MYC. And I'm drawing you, your attention to this red dot up here, which is uh, increased in its expression by MYC and in a very significant way. And that gene is called ST6-GALNAC4. And all that alphabet soup tells me it's a sialyl transferase that puts sialic acid onto an underlying sugar called N-acetyl galactosamine or GALNAC. And 
pictorially, what that enzyme was known to catalyze was this reaction where it takes a trisaccharide substrate, which has the pink diamond, that's sialic acid, linked to galactose, linked to N-acetylgalactosamine, and it will put a second sialic acid onto that structure down here on this N-acetylgalactosamine. So you go from a monosialyl structure to a disialyl structure. And the underlying trisaccharide is sometimes called the T antigen in the glyco vernacular. So we would refer to the product as disialyl T. That was cool. And consistent with having an upregulation of that enzyme, we also found that the abundance of that disialyl T structure was modulated by MYC expression. So when cells were in the MYC on state with high MYC, the disialyl T structure was the predominant O-linked glycan on the surface of these T-ALL cells. And its precursor, sialyl T, was less abundant. By contrast, when MYC was off, we did the mass spectrometry, and we saw a reduction in disialyl T and a, con a commensurate increase in the abundance of its precursor. Again, consistent with the idea that MYC is driving an increase in transcription of the RNA encoding this enzyme and the product of the enzymatic reaction tracks with RNA expression. Importantly, using the Siglec FC reagents as flow cytometry probes, we found that MYC can drive an increase in Siglec binding as a, basically a, a function of uh, transcription of ST6 galnac 4 so these red bars are a heat map where the darker red, the more SIGLEC FC binding there is to the cell surface. And you know, all the action is really up here. These are SIGLEC FCs for human SIGLEC 9, human SIGLEC 7, a couple of murine SIGLECs. But you can see the story here where for some of these SIGLECs, they bind more avidly to the cell surface when MIC is on than when MIC is off. And when we used CRISPR to knock out ST6 GALNAC4, we lost entirely the binding to human SIGLEC7 and had kind of partial loss of binding to SIGLEC9. So when you put all of this together, it allowed Dean and myself to craft a model for what might be happening here. In this setting, MYC seems to drive increased transcription of ST6 GALNAC4, which leads to increased enzyme activity in the Golgi compartment so that there's a higher flux in the conversion of the sialyl T trisaccharide to the disialyl T tetrasaccharide. And the consequence of that is that there's an increased density of disialyl T structures on the surface of these cells, which allows them to engage SIGLEC7 more avidly and deliver inhibitory signals to the immune cell. So that's our model. And consistent with that model, Anya Deutzmann, who's the postdoc in Dean's lab, and now I think she's been advanced to kind of a lecturer position. Um, she did an experiment where she engrafted into mice either the intact TALL cells with a safe a harbor targeting CRISPR or the ST6 GALNAC4 knockout TALL cells. And what she found is that whereas the wild type cells with the safeguard CRISPR system, they grow at kind of the normal rate, if you knock out ST6 GALNAC4, they don't grow very well at all. They're hard to engraft. Um, and she analyzed these tumors after their resection, and they've gone hot, infiltrated with immune cells. So it's suggestive that ST6 GALNAC4 as an enzyme inside the cell is a critical node that takes these cells from overexpression of an oncogene to an altered glycocalyx with higher levels of sialic acid. And if we're right about that, and I think there's more experiments for us to do, but if we're right, this might be another target for immune therapy. Because in principle, if you had a small molecule inhibitor of this enzyme that would get into the cell, shut down its activity, you could prevent the synthesis of these SIGLEC ligands and expose these cells to greater immune reactivity. And so we would like to explore that and kind of gearing up to do that. So with that, let me summarize what I think the takeaway message ought to be here. When I started this talk, I kind of gave you the backstory, sort of pre-Stanford story, um, at which point we had determined that tumor sialoglycans 
engage immune cell SIGLEC receptors and drive immune suppression. And then when we moved here, we tried to develop therapeutics that leveraged that discovery. And the first of those was a targeted degrader of sialoglycans, the sialidase conjugates, um, which we demonstrated have immune therapy activity in mouse models, and which now finally are making their way to human clinical trials. And then finally, I told you about our collaborative work with Dean Felscher's group, where we discovered that MYC can drive the expression of a key enzyme that leads to overproduction of SIGLEC ligands. And we're going to explore whether that enzyme could be a viable target for small molecule drugs that are immune therapies. So with that, uh, let me thank the many people from my team that contributed to this work. I mentioned most of them by name. Um, many of them have graduated and moved on to higher things, but we still are working hard on this problem in the laboratory. So many students and postdocs on this list are kind of pushing the frontiers of SIGLEC science forward. Um, I've benefited tremendously from direct collaborators as well as many kind of indirect advisors, some of whom are sitting here in the audience, thank you, um, that are teaching me about what patients need and how to think about what makes a good drug target and what should be avoided. And of course, none of this would happen without the generous support that I've enjoyed over most of my career now, uh, first from the National Cancer Institute from the NIH, as well as the NIGMS then from the Howard Hughes Medical Institute, and most recently from Stanford. So with that, um, thank you very much for coming. It's a great honor for me to be the first person in this series, and I'm happy to entertain questions. Thank you. Thank you, Carolyn, for a wonderful talk. We have time for some questions now, and we have uh, the opportunity to take questions here in the room but also online for those of you who are on Zoom. And if you have questions online, I'll put the question in the, in the Q&A uh, box and Dr. Rohatke will relay those to the audience. But uh, let's start with some questions here in the audience, please. Yes. There's a hand. Great talk. Great talk. Um, for your antibody sialidase conjugate, um, how was the HER2 target chosen? And would you anticipate there being any issues with using like a immune checkpoint inhibitor antibody as the uh, other part of the conjugate in that? Great questions. Prescient, in fact, I would go so far as to say. Um, you know, we chose HER2, let me go back to that cartoon here, um, simply because it is an antibody that has been studied to death. <laughs> and you kind of know what to expect when you work with HER2. It's been tested in lots of different models. It's a really easy antibody to work with. It expresses like five grams per liter. So, you know, even your undergraduate summer rotation student can make butt loads of it, and play with it. It's very stable. You can do chemistry on it without killing it. You can mutate it to hell and it seems fine. Um, so, when we, when we used HER2 as our model, we really had no expectation that our first clinical candidates would be based on HER2. In fact, the consultants that we spoke to about whether HER2 was a good targeting element were like, oh gosh, don't do HER2. There's so many HER2 therapies. And you know how it works. If you want to kind of break in and start a clinical trial, there's so many HER2 therapies before you. And if a patient has failed lots of other HER2 therapies, do you really want to go after another HER2 therapy with that same patient population. What I mean by that is a patient can go on, her, on Herceptin and fail. Then they can go on an antibody drug conjugate made with Herceptin that Roche markets called Cadsila and fail. And then you can go on another antibody drug conjugate made by AstraZeneca and Daiichi Sankyo called NHER2 and fail. And there's other HER2 therapeutics that are more advanced clinical trials right now. And we'd be coming in behind that and so, you know, there were so many people advising us, don't do HER2, do something else. So at Pallion, we continued to use HER2 as sort of like a model, but then we developed other, you know, this is a platform. You could stick any antibody here and, and a sialidase there. And so we do have an antibody against um, actually PDL1. That's one of our antibodies. We also learned, I didn't go through the details here, but the SIGLECs have a complicated biology where 
they can bind ligands on an opposing cell like I showed in trans, but they can also engage ligands on the same cell in cis. And there's a competition between cis ligands and trans ligands. That's part of their regulation. And it was also kind of known in the literature for decades that if you strip sialic acids off of immune cells, forget cancer cells, just immune cells, they're more easily reacted. reacted. They, their threshold for reactivity drops. You can get a B cell to activate, a T cell to activate. Macrophages become more phagocytic the minute you take the sialic acids off. That's because normally the siglex on those immune cells are clustered with cis ligands and there's a tonic signaling. And so when you shut down the tonic inhibitory signaling, they're hot and ready to go. So at Pallion, we have also actually made sialidases that are targeted to the immune cells, not the cancer cells, right? So Pallion's doing a lot of different things here. Having said all that, we kind of came full circle and finally decided that actually the trastuzumab sialidase was a viable clinical candidate. And there were reasons for this. Um, first of all, there's lots of HER2 therapeutics approved and in the pipeline. They're not immune therapies, right? So having a HER2 immune therapy is kind of a different beast from having an, a HER2 antibody drug conjugate. Um, but it was hard for us to get traction in the US, so we partnered with a Chinese company and we're gonna develop it in China. Thank you, another question. That was a beautiful talk. Um, so I was curious, you were talking about the role of these uh, sialoglycans in cancer immunotherapy. Have you looked at all at using these sialidases to incorporate into CAR T cell construct? Um, for CAR T cell therapy to see if that may help to um, account for some of the um, diseases or patients in which we don't see a response or diminished response? Yes, thank you. So groups have done that already now and published. There's a couple of labs have published on putting sialidases on CAR T cells. If you sialidase treat a CAR T cell as hot, hotter than it would be otherwise, just like any T cell, it's hotter. Um, so that has been done in academic settings. Uh, I know of a company that's trying to translate that into a, you know, clinical candidate. Um, it's also been done with NK cells. So car, sorry, CAR NK cells have been adorned with sialidases. And, um, you know, the interesting feature here is that when you put a sialidase on a, an immune cell permanently, it's going to be hot and stay hot. And, you know, you might want to cool it down, right? Um, so I have a, a, a physician postdoc in my lab who actually has come up with an idea for how to transiently engage, uh, you know, CAR T's with sialidases. And so that's going to hopefully be our little contribution to this, but there's groups out ahead of us already on this. Howard. You recognized Howard through his mask. Hi, Carolyn, a wonderful talk. Um, can you tell us about this new enzyme, like the one that Mick turns on, the sialotransferase? Like, what does it do in other cells in the body? Like, if you were to inhibit it, I guess now, like globally, yeah. right? Like, what would happen? ST6 Galmac 4 um, has barely been studied academically. Um, it's not on the grid. <laughs> So I don't think we know what would happen systemically if we inhibit or knock out that enzyme and that should be looked at. Um, that's, that's the beauty of, that's both a, the beauty and the tragedy of glycoscience is when you make a discovery, chances are there isn't much literature to help guide you and you kind of have to write the book from scratch. On, on the flip side, you're often first out of the gate. So we don't know. We have a question from Zoom. So this is a question from Harvey Cohen, who asks, um, in the EMT6 model, uh, the effect of the sialidase is, seems to be on tumor growth rather than tumor killing. Do you see actually tumor killing at higher doses? That's a good question. Um, there is some tumor killing going on. It's immune cell mediated, but it's not 100% complete, and there's still some slow growth in there. Um, I can't really say for sure. And... and um, the reason, one of the complexities here is that the siglex are not well conserved between humans and mouse. So whereas humans have 16 siglex family members, mice have 14, and there isn't like a one-to-one -one match. So like we have siglex seven and siglex nine, these two discrete siglex, and mice have one siglex, siglex E, that seems to be kind of a hybrid of the two. 
So we never know in the mouse model whether what we're doing reflects exactly what you would see in the human disease. Um, mouse and K cells don't seem to express any SIGLEX, whereas human and K cells have SIGLEX 7, SIGLEX 9. Um, so we don't really know. The only thing we can say is that um, when we go into humans, <laughs> we'll find out. You know, not much else can be said. Um, we have other models where with just the sialidase treatment, you can get, for example, uh, you know, in a cohort of six mice, you might get five, like one total response, five partial responses out of six mice with a sialidase treatment alone. But then you combine it with Keytruda, PD-1 block, and you can get, you can cure every single mouse. And then they have durable memory and you can't even graft those same cells later. So that's a suggestion that maybe you'd wanna have a combination treatment. And in our phase one, two trial, uh, the one that's launched here at Stanford, um, the plan for the phase two is to branch off some of the patients and do a combination with the Regeneron anti-PD-1. Maybe time for one more question back. Thank you for the great talk. Um, I'm uh, very curious uh, about the relative contributions of the, uh, the ST6 uh, GALNAC4 enzyme that you identified versus other branches of the immune system, such as adaptive immune system. And for example, if you um, inhibit it, uh, would you also inhibit those mechanisms even in, in immunosuppressive populations, such as uh, T regulatory cells, uh, and um, making the immune system kind of fight against each other? These are great questions. Um, what was the first one? <laughs> Sorry. Uh, uh, it, for example, the effect of that knockout in an immunocompetent mouse model. Oh, this ST6 GALNAC4 knockout. Okay, this is a good question. What is the effect of ST6 GALNAC4 knockout in an immune competent mouse? And we don't know. Um, we would like to make that mouse and find out. So we don't know that. Um, you might be sort of referencing indirectly the fact that. Uh, Anya ran this model in a RAG minus minus mouse. Um, she did that for a, a practical reason, just because this particular cell type, these TALL cells, they actually do not graft well at all in a totally immune intact animal. So we couldn't grow tumors to actually ask this question. So we needed partially immune compromised mice for this. You also asked something about adaptive immunity versus innate immunity, I think, you had a, that was baked into your question. Um, the Siglec family are really interesting in this regard because they bridge and span both adaptive and innate immunity. So they modulate T cell reactivity and B cell reactivity. They contribute to adaptive immunity that way. CD22 on the B cell is Siglec2, okay? Um, but then they also modulate innate immunity through myeloid cells, NK cells, and so on. And so we're of the mind that when you hit the Siglec axis, you're probably going to be potentiating both of these compartments, both adaptive and innate. And we, if anything, we worried about safety in humans. But so far, you know, in our clinical trial with now, you know, a few dozen patients, we haven't seen any adverse reactions and we're almost at the highest dose. In monkeys and sinos, we saw no adverse events over a fairly long period of time with very high dose treatment. Um, so we'll see what all that means, you know, clinically. Um, but until you do this in humans, I just don't, just don't think we know and very excited to find out. Well, I think I, I would like to, at this point, thank you all for your attendance and thank you, Carolyn, for a wonderful talk. Thank you. I also want to announce that our next seminar is Dr. Lena Gandhi from Harvard Medical School and Dana-Farber Cancer Institute on February 14th. This seminar series is gonna move from this location to Munzer in the basement of Beckman. So please join us there. Um, Dr. Gandhi will be speaking about drug development and um, exciting clinical trials that she's um, run in her career in industry and, and in academia. I wanna thank the SCI events team for an incredible job in putting on this event. Thank you. And please join us outside, I hope it's not pouring, for um, our reception and hope Carolyn can stick around for that. So thank you. Great.